I'm here with Ozzy and Jonah, and uh, we've been having conversations recently about the rapture, and I've been asked several times over the last several weeks about the rapture, several different conversations that have gone that direction or people who have come specifically to ask about that. Yeah. And uh, I've been working on an article about it in English and in Turkish and wanting to say something about it. So I decided we'd put together a quick video response to those questions in the form of a conversation with Jonah and Ozzy. And, um, and then we'll follow it up with some other articles and resources and things. Uh, so let's, let's first start talking about what the rapture is. Uh, I, I grew up with a view of the rapture, right? I imagine you did it as same, well. Same thing here. Yeah. We had that idea that, you know, God is coming. Mm. Will you be ready when the Lord shall come? Because you know? mm -hmm. some people <laughs> suck some. Yeah. And, and all of us that have seen the dog bad will just stay. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay, so I, my there were you know, there were there would be visiting preachers come to my church and ask questions like, "What if the rapture happens and you're in the movie theater?" And the assumption was obviously if you were in the movie theater when the rapture happened, you wouldn't get you're not doing something godly taken up bumper stickers that say, "In case of rapture, this car will be unmanned." <laughs> Or uh, growing up in junior high, we go to these Christian concerts where the the musician would shout "Rapture practice," and then everybody's supposed to just stand up and jump. Rapture practice. <laughs> uh, so let's. What is the rapture? The rapture is this idea that at some point before the actual second coming of Jesus, the church and all of the believers are going to disappear get taken up or caught up in the air. Believers are going to disappear and what's left are the people who were not chosen, the people who were not saved, the people who were not taken up. Um, now usually this view comes together with a perspective about the tribulation. We're going to talk a bit about that as well. Um, so the, the view, um, as I grew up with it, a kind of a pre-tribulation rapture view, although there are other ways to order the tribulation and the yeah. rapture. The idea was that um, at some point there's going to be this secret coming of Jesus where the church is raptured up and people are, the cars are left on man, people just disappear. And then what's left are the people who are destined, because they were not believers, to go through an intense seven-year tribulation when it's going to get really, really difficult. And then, uh, so I grew up with movies about that. Um, you know, the late great planet Earth was a bit before my time, Hal Lindsey. But then um, I grew up with a, a movie series called the Thief in the Night series. And this song, a uh, Larry Norman song, I wish we'd all been ready. <laughs> and, um, and that movie series was just downright terrifying. I think for me, I grew up with books like the Left Behind series. Yeah. I, I remember my mom had the stacks of books of... The Left Behind, I think it's a three-part series. There's mm -hmm. the Left Behind, then the Team Relation, and I don't remember the last one, but it was like a three-series book of just, you better be ready or else. Yeah, it really is a, like an apocalyptic yeah. kind of Soviet <laughs> worldview, like right after, it's the end times, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's easy to, to make into like a dramatic series or movie or book. It's just, and since Jonah has not grown up with this view, um, it's, it's, you're so lucky, bro. <laughs> but every Halloween in my church youth group, we would um, show the Left Behind, I'm sorry, the Thief in the Night series, because it was so darn scary, and it was like, appropriate for Halloween, and it would scare people to Jesus, um, and I spent much of my youth not questioning that view, it wasn't until I was quite a bit older uh, that I started asking why I believed in the rapture view, and I came to the conclusion um, that I just don't believe the rapture. I mean, it was many years ago now that I just realized that the rapture just doesn't have um, any good evidence for it, both in terms of theology, history, and scripture. So uh, that's what I wanted to talk about today. I want to present a case. Um, I'm going to summarize it in four points, present a case for why I do not believe in the rapture. 
and like what you just said i just had no one ever question that mm-hmm. view and it's all i just believed in i just thought that this is what every christian believed yeah i didn't realize that with the idea of the end times yes, eschatology, there are other views for it, right. just that one view. So it was until, I think it was one time when you were like, oh, you don't believe in the rapture. This was like years ago. Is he not a Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Does he want, doesn't he want to go to heaven? I thought that was the plan, you know? He's asking to give us more I don't think, I, I think I'm following the wrong path. I think I'm making friends with the wrong crowd. <laughs> this is the example of evil communication, corrupt this manner's type of thing. Yeah. But then, I, I I had to probe further because I I I know you personally and I recognize that this is somebody who would have thought about this thing mm. well. So I was like, well, I'm not going to hear anything from this person anymore. Mm. For now, let me just investigate. Mm. And so the the first checking thing about it was how yeah no one actually believed it until the late eighteen yeah yeah, yeah right I, now. anyway so it was just so crazy yeah. Yeah, it is not a historic doctrine of the church. <laughs> it's not a historic doctrine of the church in any of the major brands of Christianity, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant. It just isn't a part of historical Christian um, doctrine. But we're going to get there. So, yeah. all right, so my uh, my case against the rapture, I've divided into four parts, and I'm, I'm just going to give a brief summary of each of these four points. Both of them... Um, are quite broad, and so you could go much deeper in all four of these points, but my uh, idea here is just to give a summary of the argument, the evidence for why I don't believe in the rapture, and to keep the video short. So the first line of evidence, why I don't believe in the rapture, is that the rapture view, whether you think of it as um, a pre-tribulation or a mid-tribulation rapture view, the rapture view divides the second coming of Jesus into two events. There's a first event which is like a secret kind of coming. Nobody's going to see him except all the Christians just disappear and sci-fi style what happened? There's neatly folded piles of clothing (laughs) unmanned cars and um, the space stations now, you know, half of the astronauts are gone or whatever and and, um, that is the first part, the rapture part (laughs) taken up. And then um at some later point, the actual return of Jesus. But um, I don't find that distinction or that division taught anywhere in the Bible. The The Bible teaches all throughout, especially the emphasis of the New Testament, about the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming back. But the second coming is about the judgment, about the resurrection, about the new creation. And these are intertwined. That We don't get a chronology or a, an order of events like that, in order to, uh, that would justify dividing the second coming of Jesus mm. into uh, two parts like that. Mm. Um, they're all described as part of the package of the second coming. Right now, we live in the world which is yet to be fully redeemed. The kingdom is not fully realized here yet, but one day it will be. That's the promise of the Bible that happens at the second coming. Um, but I don't find any justification for dividing it that way. And I, I grew up with these charts, like dispensationalist charts, where the, the goal was to try to, to, try to um, reconcile passages in Matthew or Daniel or Revelation or Ezekiel and then um, try to correlate those with modern events and to try to, to map out a kind of a timeline of events. Um, but I don't think that's the goal of any of the authors of the Bible. Sure. Um, and I'll come to a point similar to that at, at the end. But this is my first argument against the rapture, is that it unjustifiably divides the second coming of Jesus into two comings, or two events. Is he coming once or is he coming twice? Uh, you really have to argue that he's coming twice in order to defend the rapture view. And, and of course, the more you think about it, it like the two comments, it doesn't start to add up in your mind. You you find the holes that it makes there, but because you are taught not to question it as much, you don't try to think about it so much. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but when I read Revelations, it gives me an idea of, you know, that, mm. in quotes. But it doesn't really. Yeah. And, so, and so the question is, how am I able to even rationalize all that? But then, they just, shh, don't worry, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it seems like, an excuse to, to match up those 
those parts, those parts, so you you can justify yeah. your your view on the subject. Yeah. yeah, and if you grew up just, I grew up, I grew up with it as an unquestioned assumption, yeah. as you're saying. Right. Um, but so that's my first line of argument: is that why why should we divide mm-hmm. the second coming into mm-hmm. two events or two comings of Christ when the New Testament doesn't divide it that way? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Second reason why I don't believe in the rapture is that the passages that are used to defend a rapture view are misinterpreted when they are used to defend a rapture view. So there are um, probably four passages that are commonly used, but two that are always at the center of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I want to look at uh, both of them. For me, this is, I think this was one of the major ones. You know, mm-hmm. when I heard you first say you don't believe in the rapture, I'm just like, doesn't this man read the Bible, you know? Because <laughs> I had read and interpreted these verses that the, the way they were taught to me, you mm. know? And we will mention the verses, obviously, here. But mm. So, thinking, I could not find a way to remove myself from thinking about the rapture whenever I would see these passages. Yeah. But this was because I had, in all honesty, not read the books that they were in, in the whole nature of the book. Like, mm. I had not gotten the full idea of the book, the holistic idea of the book. Yeah. So, it was still chapter by chapter reading I had done all throughout my life or what I was taught. So it was like, yeah, Ryan, oh, I'm going to pray for him. <laughs> and if you if you do that, I mean, if you just read a verse or two verses with that doctrine in mind, you can see how people would see it as support sure. for that rapture doctrine. Um, but as you say, when you read it in the context of the book or even just in the context of the chapter or the sermon, um, you I think we'll be able to see here that it just isn't a... a um, part of the teaching of the New Testament. It's like having a preconceived conclusion and then looking for evidence. True. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We call that eisegesis. It's just bad Bible interpretation to, to read the Bible that way. Um, now, many of my friends, who Christian friends who do believe in the rapture, they aren't intending to do, do that. I'm just arguing that it is a, a misinterpretation of these passages to read it that way. Uh, this is a, uh, a discussion among Christians, so I've got many uh, Christian brothers and sisters, people who I love, who disagree with me about this, who do believe in the rapture. Uh, I'm just explaining why, from Bible history and theology, why I think that um, that, that isn't the case. Mm-hmm. So here's Matthew 24. Um, to give a, some context here, Matthew, you know, is, is divided into five sermons. There are five discourses that structure the book of Matthew, and the last of those is what we call the Olivet Discourse. It's, um, it corresponds to Mark chapter 13. It also corresponds in its order of events to many of the lists of uh, events that happen in the book of Revelation. Uh, but Matthew 24 gives us this um, picture of the end times, as we've come to call it, or eschatology, the uh, coming of the kingdom, the, um, the fulfillment or the culmination of God's plan on earth. Uh, so Matthew 24, 36, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Um, The passage goes on to emphasize, as you were saying, being ready. And that is the emphasis of the New Testament, to be ready. That is, there's a temptation, apparently, in the first century, as there still is today, to think that, well, um, Jesus could come back at any time. The world uh, is just destined for uh, destruction, so we should just huddle together, hold on tight, wait for rescue. Yeah. Yeah. or believers, you know, who are tempted to sell all their belongings, sit on the hill and look to the sky and, and, and wait for the return of... Is he coming yet? <laughs> no. Uh, but Jesus' teaching is to say, no, we keep sowing, we keep working, we keep praying, we keep uh, asking for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and working toward that. And that's the emphasis here. That's what being ready means, that maintaining faithfulness and vigilance. But notice the language here. This is where that left behind phrase comes from and the idea that I was taught and I imagine you were that 
what it means is that one day the rapture is going to happen and those of us who were faithful believers are going to be taken and then the unbelievers are left behind. But notice the language in the passage. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. In the flood example, to be taken means to be swept up by the wrath of God. They were swept up by the judgment of God because they weren't faithful. Mm -hmm. To be taken means to be swept away by the wrath of God. Judgment. To be left behind. You were left behind because you were faithful. You were able to stand. To remain. And that's the theme of Matthew. It's also a theme that's continued in Revelation. Being taken in this passage is not a good thing. <laughs> Being taken is a bad thing. And it's exactly the same word. Exactly the same word in the very next sentence. Two men will be in the field and one will be taken. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. I, so you're saying that in the days of Noah, being taken was bad, but now he totally turns it upside down to say being taken is suddenly a, a good thing? No, in the passage, to be taken is to be swept away by the wrath of God. This is not a passage that teaches the rapture that Jesus is going to come and rescue his church, scoop his church up out of the earth. Um, Rather, this is a passage that says we want to remain ready, alert, prepared in our faith and in our participating with God in the coming of the kingdom so that when the second coming happens, we are among those who are able to stand with him. And I think one thing that is also cool to see that if we also think about the audience Matthew is writing to, it mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Matthew is already writing to Jewish, more predominantly Jewish believers who have been persecuted, mm. ostracized by their by their relatives and they are going through hard times. In fact, you can see all throughout the book of Matthew, you can feel the emotions of, you know, encouragement and, and how Matthew is trying to encourage these believers to hang on to faith and tell them they have actually placed correct faith in Christ Jesus. Mm. So if I think about it then, I don't see him telling these people just hang on and persevere and then in the same line still tell them well it's all going to hell so just ready and and then also even whilst we read this 24 up until the second the, the, the chapter after it is 25 talking about the parable that is there the parable of the 10 virgins mm -hmm. it's still the same example or the same kind of idea that jesus is giving and the main focus is to see that have faith believe in god so the, 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 the disparity is between people who believe and people who don't believe. Yeah. And Jesus is encouraging the people who have believed that you have placed your faith rightly. And people who will read it and not have faith that place faith. Yeah, it's, it, it's not saying get a stopwatch and look at the sky. It's saying keep your faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Persevere, remain faithful. So, so if we look at it that way, we see how it doesn't add up to that idea of just being souped up and everything here just goes away it's not like you are keeping your faith and i don't see how it would be encouraging in quotes if i see if i look at the rapture view as much as just seeing what jesus is saying here and how matthew is crafting the story of telling these people using this this way to encourage them and tell them that you are already you have believed rightly mm -hmm. keep the faith going yeah stay strong yeah yeah so matthew 24 is just not a passage that teaches the rapture one of them is taken not because they were faithful, they are taken because they were not ready. Mm. They were swept away by the judgment of God. And so the rapture view kind of even puts believers on that point of asking, are you ready for the rapture? Mm. You know, it puts you in the position where we have, even in my churches, they ask you, are your works aligned with the will of God? Mm. Are you making sure that you are doing the right things? Mm. But if we see the language in which Matthew is using is, if you have faith in God, you wouldn't be swept away by the judgment the righteous judgment of God, and that's the end. Mm. Yeah, it shouldn't be a passage that's used to make us unsure of our Stop. status with God. Yeah. yeah. So the other passage that's always at the center of rapture defense is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, um, the context here in chapter 4 is that there were uh, apparently concerns in the church that 
um, believers who had died had missed out on the coming of the kingdom, had they missed the resurrection, had they missed the, the second coming of Christ, because they weren't going to be alive when it happened. Um, and Paul wants to encourage the believers that no, they don't have to worry that they've missed out because they have died um, before the second coming happens. He wants to emphasize, to remind them of the doctrine of resurrection, that our um, belief in the end of all things is that one day the resurrection is going to happen. One day all of the uh, believers who have died, everyone who has died, is going to be physically raised. And um, it doesn't matter whether you've died beforehand or not. And that's what Paul wants to emphasize here. So he says, um, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. That's First Thessalonians 4.13. So that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those, those who have fallen asleep. Again, being left here is a good thing. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So, um, I grew up hearing this passage as a defense of the rapture, that Jesus is going to come, that the um, believers are going to get caught up in the air, and that means that they're going to disappear and be with Jesus, and then left behind are the, those who were not ready, who did not place faith. But notice that the passage doesn't say anything about unbelievers being left behind here. And also, this is a passage that's teaching, uh, using a, a metaphor uh for a, a, a receiving and a returning king or a dignitary. So it uses language that, uh, that we find it in other places in the New Testament. Matthew 25, verse 6 uses the same phrase, and we see it in the Old Testament as the king returns to his city. When you can see that, that it's your king, the king is on his way, well then how there's a, a group that goes out to greet him. You want to celebrate him, as they did when they saw Jesus was entering Jerusalem. Um, the king is coming. So they go out. They're going to blow the trumpets. They're going to lay, put down the carpet. They're going to put down their branches. They want to receive the coming king. And th the point is not that you go out of the city to receive the coming king. He, he gets halfway down the road. He gets to the gate. And then he turns around and goes back down the road. No, he's coming into the city. And it's not that he comes halfway to the gate. He gets to the gate. He greets all the people coming in. He goes inside and he leaves you out there. No. No, the point is that the king returns. You greet him. You welcomed him because he's your king. And you now, together with him, are ushered into the city that is... Come in. Come into the city that is yours. And that's the, the image here, that Jesus is coming. He's not coming down the road because he's coming from the sky. He, this is after the ascension, of course, the second coming. We look to the, the angel, so he's going to come the way he, he left... He's coming down, and so we, where are we going to greet him? We're going up there to greet him in the clouds. It's a uh, uh, language about receiving, ushering in the king who is coming home. Uh, so it, just, it doesn't teach anything about unbelievers being left behind. In the passage, the word that's left behind are twice there, and they are positive. And it just is not about getting caught up in the heavens um, for a, a rapture and then a tribulation. Rather, it's about greeting the coming king. Jesus is coming back. Let's be in the clouds there to greet him and welcome him home. Yeah, it also seems to contradict the rapture view because it says we will go to be with him forever. It's not um, it's not dividing it, like you said, into two parts where we're going up there and then we're going to go back or something yep. uh, to the earth that's been renewed. It's, it's, it's one event. Mm -hmm. It's going to greet him, coming back mm -hmm. with him and then being with him forever. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this, all these things wrapped up together. This, I think, this was one of when when I first started thinking about the rapture not as a thing. This was one of the verses I 
struggled with because it's one of the things like you said that i was taught this is the first part that my mind went to but what about those people where the bible says you know sometimes you don't even know the place the bible what the bible said is written somewhere that <laughs> that will be caught up with him in the clouds you know the dead in christ will first rise. you know and i kept thinking about it but of course reading all through Thessalonians again that same idea of encouragement these people are sad these people are going through a lot of persecution and so Paul is still using that same language and if we, if we go down four five hundred years in medieval times mostly and how they relate to their king the same way you are describing is there are two things that can happen when your king goes to battle either the king comes back victoriously and everybody celebrates or you guys are going on the siege. Mm. Mm. The king has lost the battle and the army, the other army with the other king is coming to invade. Yep. So you are either going to celebrate or you are going into imprisonment. Those are the two options you have. Mm. And so for us, when we see that imagery, our king is victorious and so there is celebration. Mm. And, and that is what they will do. We go to the gates to welcome him because he has won all the battles he has fought for us and so now we go to greet our king and welcome him back it's, it's a very different image than just thinking about the rapture yeah. and it helps that i've of course seen a lot of movies that have that same greatest image so it was easy for me to place it in my mind mm. how there will be people rushing to greet and then of course the triumphant entry of jesus into jerusalem like you used was just a wonderful example for me that pain that it was like the snap moment mm, because yeah, it was right. the preemptive um, example of jesus is being welcomed back into his kingdom right. it's, it's not a mysterious thing it's very public you know, like the believers are being raised to the sky to welcome yeah jesus back home yeah, yeah. and i mean the rapture view often dictates it as like a secret thing where it's an instantaneous everybody disappears yeah, yeah. but it's a raising of uh of the dead and the greeting of the king back home yeah mm -hmm. um not not a, just a disappearance of of all of the people who had faith yeah that's right right so those are the two main passages that matthew 24 does not teach the rapture being taken is a bad thing and first thessalonians chapter four it does not teach the rapture it's about a a ritual, a tradition of receiving the king back into his city, not disappearing into the clouds to stay in the clouds. Uh, so, our third line of evidence, or our third, for me, argument of, against the rapture view is um, a historical one that, as we said at the very beginning, it isn't a historic doctrine of Christianity to believe in the rapture. In fact, no church father defended a rapture view. Uh, none of the apostles, none of the church fathers. It wasn't a view described in any of the teachings of the church. It was not a doctrine of the church of, of any uh, of the major Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant or even minor Catholic, Orthodox or Protestant um, t teachers. It's a doctrine really that doesn't exist until the 1820s. Uh, John Darby, he's an Irish evangelist, he's in Scotland, and he um, develops this view because he has this kind of mentality of trying to, trying to coordinate Matthew and Revelation and Daniel and figure out some airtight chart that will allow him to map out a chronology of end times events, and he kind of pieces together this, this rapture view. It became really popular in the 1830s. He's a charismatic speaker, and he's got a Bible study with the rich and wealthy in uh, Ireland and Scotland. And, um, and out of that, there's this Schofield reference Bible that becomes really influential. And that reference Bible picks up um, this Darby view, which is sometimes called inductive Darbyism. And that, that Bible became really popular in seminaries in America. Uh, especially conservative evangelical seminaries and seminaries like Dallas Theological Seminary that's pumping up pastors um, in the 20th century for American churches. And so is that reference Bible, Dallas Theological Seminary, and then the other Bible schools that picked up that view um, in the early 1900s, and it became then a 20th century phenomenon. Boom. 
Darbyism, where this rapture view became really popular uh, throughout the 20th century. But it's a view really that doesn't exist until the 1820s. But I recently read a, a, a defense of um, a pre-tribulation rapture view from a professor at Liberty University, in which he was trying to um, trying to say that there is historic evidence for a rapture view, and he had he had dug up exactly f four mentions of what he considered a kind of a, a rapture uh, theology from um, from from before Darby, um, but they were all really not only obscure but not actually references to the rapture, and the last one was in, was in the 1700s. So um, if that's it, if that's the historic case for the rapture, four mentions in 2,000 years, and one of them from the 18th century, um, it, even if they were legitimate references to the rapture, which in this paper they just were not, then certainly we would just say, well, that's just sort of a, a historical blip, a, a, you know, an idiosyncrasy, not, uh, not a teaching of the church. And he's still not as close to the original story. He's far that away from yes. history. Much uh, farther, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, that, for me, was one of the major considerations. Um, when I realized that, I just started researching that and recognized that none of the church fathers believe this. I mean, surely if they did, they would have taught it, but none of them do, not a single one of them. Um, this is, just because somebody didn't teach it in the past doesn't mean it's not true, but if nobody in Christian history has taught it until the 1800s, um, and you're claiming that it is the right interpretation of the Bible, of these passages, and it's something we all should have been able to see, um, then that certainly raises red flags. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a major reason why I don't believe in the rapture. I think, I think earlier, like I was saying, this was one of the ones that hit me strong, you know, because mm. I just grew up never having a framework for any other type of way the world was going to end. It just did not exist. So to to see this was really, I mean, worrisome for me in a way that why, why is no one saying anything about this? Why? And then, of course, also knowing the kind of background I had, not a lot of people have dug really deep into church history. Mm. And so it will make sense why the most people do not have that idea or most people just, you know, take it and hold it and this is what we have been fed because most people have not studied or done any form of church history. And so once we start to uncover that, once we do some little bit, just go into it, we start to see what, what you're saying. It's not there. And the fact that no single person mentions it Mm. And it is the main thing. It's kind of like you said, worrisome. I mean, I'm just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. So my my fourth point here is also an answer to the question: Does it matter? Um, so it doesn't really matter. Should we even bother talking about it? And on the one hand, I want to recognize that this is a point of secondary doctrinal importance. True. So it's not a, a matter of primary doctrine. It's not something like uh, the existence of God or the Trinity or salvation by faith or the crucifixion or resurrection of Jesus or the inspiration of Scripture, which are all primary doctrinal issues. Um, how we think the end times are going to unravel uh, is not insignificant, but it's a secondary doctrinal question. So we shouldn't uh, need to divide over these questions. Um, but we do want to know what's true. We want to think about it. It's right to wrestle with the questions. And I think it does matter because a rapture view contributes to a way of thinking about the gospel, mm -hmm. which is based on escape from the world. As if the gospel were a way of, one day we're going to finally get out of here. Uh, and that I grew up also with this idea that the world is just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse until it finally just all blows up and we're going to be rescued. Finally, he's going to get us out of here. And so the strategy of the church is, is circle the ships, huddle together. Let's just hold on tight until he comes home and gets us out of here. Um, and that is not compatible with the teachings of the New Testament. The rapture view supports that kind of view, of view that, that kind of perspective, that 
Whew, one day he's going to get us out of here and then just let them do whatever they're going to do down there to ruin the place. Uh, but the teaching of the New Testament is that God is in control of the events of the world. God is in control of the events of the world even in a way that incorporates the free will, even the evil decisions of the people who are in it. And his plan is coming to pass. It is unraveling. It is getting to his intended destination even through the decisions of the people in the world, even through the bad decisions of people in the world. If God's will is going to be ultimately done, he wins in the end. And his plan is not to just scrap the world. It's not, whew, thank God that's all over. Rather, his plan is for the restoration of the world. Behold, I am making all things new. The kingdom is coming. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is coming. He is making all things new. He's renewing all things. He's inviting us to be a part of that and to see the second coming as the culmination of that renewal, as the finishing touch, as the final unraveling of that renewal, uh, rather than a God who's sitting back waiting for, oh, I wish I could just end this whole human experiment, <laughs> uh, which is what the rapture who makes it seem like to me. Ooh, yeah. The escape kind of theology also demotivates. It seems like it's a demotivating factor for believers to not do good works or just to not try to improve the world mm. just to get through it. So, well, mm -hmm. anyways. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's all going to burn, so yeah. why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why do anything? Because it's going to go, all going to go. It's all going to burn anyway. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what, what, what has changed my mind is going back to Genesis. Mm. When yeah. God made the world, he said it was good. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and 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 that's that is a true statement that has been all throughout the world and and, and since from the beginning God made the world mm -hmm. and He made everything good. Yeah. Although sin entered the world and changed the nature of God's good world, this is still God's good world. God's right. good world. Yeah. It's not it's not a downward spiral. It's an upward one. Yeah. 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 So let me end then with a thought from um, Revelation, which. Of course, so much of this discussion centers around the events in Revelation. Um, many of my um, friends who do believe a rapture view, uh, they are trying to find it in Revelation, to fit it in Revelation. Of course, it's significant to say that nowhere in Revelation is the rapture taught or even mentioned. Um, but the rapture view, as I said at the beginning, often goes together with a perspective about the tribulation, where the tribulation is thought to be a specific intense period of uh, persecution of badness that'll last seven years um, and I want to point out that for John that idea of tribulation whether you think that there's going to be some kind of intensification of evil um, leading up to the second coming or not the idea of tribulation isn't just some future seven-year event for John it's much more broad than that. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, in verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation. Now, the NIV translated that, translates it as suffering. Uh, other tr tr um, translations will translate that verse in other ways. Uh, but the word is the same as the word that's used for tribulation later in the book. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John considers the tribulation to be this, to be the fact that we are living according to the values of a kingdom that are at odds with the system of this world in a way that often leads to suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true now. It will be true in the future. The message of Revelation is that even though that is true, that we are at odds with the system of this world in a way that often leads to our suffering, in the end, Jesus wins. And if we are patient and endure, as John says in that verse, then we will participate with Jesus in his ultimate victory. The book of Revelation isn't a book of secret codes to try to unlock, to demystify, uh, to you know, undecode it so that we can predict the future. The book of Revelation is an encouragement to the believers in that day that uses symbolic imagery that those believers would have understood. He's speaking their language 
to encourage them to say, in all of this chaos, God is in control. Right. And to, to treat the Bible, Revelation, and Daniel um, as codes to unlock, the, it, it seems like missing or skimming over the, the actual point, the deeper point that's there. Yeah. I mean, trying to find uh, numbers and data to make a chronology and so it's going, it's going to come back on 23rd of November, 2053. Um, it, it, it seems like putting your time into that is to miss the deeper point of yeah. these passages. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Right. So that's why I don't believe in the, in, in, in the rapture. I don't believe in the rapture because it divides the second coming into two events. It's unjustified in the New Testament. I don't believe it because you have to misinterpret the passages that are used to defend it. I don't believe the rapture because it's historically a very recent thing that no church father or um, uh, early theologian believed or taught. It doesn't appear until the 19th century. And I don't believe the rapture because I think it takes uh, our emphasis away from the teachings of Scripture about participating with God in the coming of the kingdom and contributes instead to a view of escaping the world, which is at odds with the teaching of Jesus, including the, te the, the teaching of the book of Revelation. Yeah. And again, it's just just to go over it. I just think about how the way people would view some of these passages and even the book of Revelation would determine how they live their lives, mm -hmm. what what goes on. So a way to put it is just thinking about whatever verse or chapter or book you're reading, not just look at it in the context of it, but thinking about the people mm -hmm. that it's been written to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and the existing culture around the people, not just the Jews that it's been written to, yeah. but the for the revelation, the Greek or Roman world around them yeah. and how those people live their lives. In the book of Daniel too, not just thinking about the the, um, the Israelites, but the Babylonians in those times mm -hmm. and how they live their lives. All those things contribute to how we read the Bible. Yeah. There is always there is always a deeper context mm -hmm. because these people are writing in a culture with other people living around them. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like um, John is called up and has no clue what's happening in the world. And yeah. he's, he's not writing in a vacuum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's writing to a culture, to a people in a mm -hmm. certain culture who live in a world. Yeah. It's just like how we would make emphasis on writing to a Nigerian right now yeah. in 2022. Yeah. or an American, or people living in Cyprus. There's a way we would view the world that if you are writing to either of these people, you have to take cues from that world. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question to ask as I read the Bible, is how would the original audience have understood this? Yeah. What did Matthew intend for his audience to understand? What would the audience have understood, understood from, from it. Yeah. what Matthew wrote? Uh, or what did John mean, or what did his audience understand from what he wrote in, in Revelation. Mm. To get at that picture, we have to include an understanding of the cultural context okay. around. So, yeah, make a decision for yourself. You know, as I said, this is a, an in-house discussion. This is a, uh, uh, a view about um, the end times of, that Christians disagree on, and you can disagree on uh, this question. This is why I don't believe in the rapture. You've heard us talk about that. Uh, feel free to respond here uh, in the comments or talk to me and um, I'd love to keep a conversation about these things going. Yeah.